Be seated, yeah, everyone is sitting. All right. Uh, welcome back to Cambridge Talks, the yearly conference organized by PhD students at the GSD. My name is Manuel Lopez, I'm a PhD student here. And it is my pleasure to introduce the second panel of the day entitled Total Utopias. I would like to begin by sharing some, uh, some thoughts about the meaning of that phrase and the questions it might, it might pose. Uh, that, and I'll start with this uh, image of Thomas More's uh, utopia. That, that Thomas More's vision for an alternative society should have a, as its setting an island afloat somewhere in the new world comes as no surprise. For a rising English statesman writing in the, in the age of discovery, its remote character served at a time to keep himself at safe distance from his own words and to fuel the, the reader's imagination. Its insularity endowed the commonwealth he described with the self-contention that any alternative experiment in social ordering seems to call for. The foundational locus of modern utopian thought was thus an island, the bounded territory par excellence. And yet, I would suggest that within Moore's book, in tension with that centripetal thrust, there is an equally powerful, even though apparently less salient, impulse towards crossing boundaries, towards breaking the pressings set both within the island and around it. It is not only that the etymology of the word locates utopia o topos nowhere, and therefore one could say anywhere, and in the end potentially everywhere, <laughs> Uh, it is rather that the struggle between confinement and expansion permeates the whole of Moore's construct. From the regulation of travel and commerce between cities to the declaration of war against neighboring states. This shows clearly in the plates produced for historical editions of the book. We usually pay attention only to the body emerging at the center of the picture and ignore the land masses that encircle it, which however stand quite close. As Moore tells us, it is over those lands that utopians spilled over whenever demographics put an unbearable pressure on the island's cities, setting up colonies, exploiting them for agriculture, and engaging in contentious reports with the autochthonous population. May it be that the ambitions of utopianism are inherently boundless, that no matter how hermetically sealed ideal worlds might need to be, a totalizing impulse from within would drive them towards the unbound? We are familiar with the prescriptions many of those dreamed regimes intended to impose on human life, regulating it frantically down to the latest detail. Those we could call inward moving totalizations. But what about, what about totalization in the opposite direction, as it comes forth in Utopia's colonial endeavors? This panel offers the opportunity to delve into the effects on space of those seemingly immoderate desires. How has mastery over large scales been attempted? Mastery over the territory, the, over the environment, even over the cosmos. The sun as a domesticated source of energy in Professor Daniel Barber's presentation, for instance. An answer that immediately springs to mind is through technology. It will be inevitable that with modernity, any sense of all-powerfulness over large geographical expanses should rest on some combination of their expertise and resourceful institutional patronage. This did not, es did not escape more, whose utopia was founded on the technical prowess of making an island there where there was none before. The country was turned into an island only after Utopos, the conqueror, having brought civilization to the natives, decided to separate them from the continent and to bring the sea around them by opening a wide waterway, causing admiration and terror among neighboring nations. The island of Utopia was the result of an act of violence over the crust of the earth, a feat of appropriation through civil engineering, at the time captivating and frightening. Thus, since the inception of modernity, the dream of control over the environment finds its highest and most terrible fulfillment in the flights of our imagination. On such lasting fantasy, Professor Sarah Pritchard is going to elaborate through the case of the post-war attempts at taming the Rhone River in France. The bound and the unbound, the embodied and the total. By organizing the conference around these two panels, we are in fact attempting to delve into modern utopianism through a play of opposites that dates as far back as its first literary eruption. 
it shows in Moore's tale under several guises articulated around the political organization of the island, for instance, a constellation of federated autonomous cities, however, located on a dimensionally, dimensionally homogeneous urban network and all looking like each other. And it comes out rather humorously in the ordering of internal tourism, organized around a gradient of boundedness, tying each inhabitant to his town on one ex extreme to the whole island on the other. Do the citizen of, of Utopia keen on exploring the unbounded confines of his country beyond his town? A passport was issued and all kinds of comforts for the journey offered, but the passport carried an expiration date. And if found wandering around past it, past that expiration date, then he was beaten or enslaved. The consequences of his unruliness very much felt upon his body, literally embodied. Thus, the duality seems inescapable to the point that it is hard to resist the constant back and forth between the unpacking of large schemes and the careful study of their punctual impacts, as on the body of the unfortunate traveller. How may we trace their concrete, often unintended effects on given localities, social groups or individuals? May we attempt to map their quotidian manifestations, something like people's experience of modern utopia, sometimes captivating, others premonitory, usually traumatic and maybe empowering. The latter is going to be the focus of uh, Dr. Abby Spinak's paper, a reflection on the, on the instances of resistance triggered by energy infrastructure in the United States. So with all this in mind, I would now like to introduce our first speaker. As in the previous session, the panelists will present their work first and then we'll gather in a joint discussion open to the public. Daniel Barber is visiting professor of environment and humanities at the Princeton Environmental Institute and an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. His research explores the relationship between architecture and the emergence of global environmental culture across the 20th century. He has published extensively in journals. His book, A House in the Sun, Modern Architecture and Solar Energy in the Cold War, will be published by Oxford University Press this year. His talk today is entitled The Solar House and Other Not-So-Utopian Futures, circa 1952. Please jo join me in welcoming Professor Barber. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you to, um, to the organizing committee for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here, and actually a real pleasure to sort of subject this material uh, to the framework of utopia, which uh, isn't one that I had uh, really kind of thought through on these terms before, so a real nice instigation to do so. Okay, this tells me what to do, right? Okay. I got it, I think. We'll see. Okay. So I want to talk today about solar houses, and more specifically, about a rich and dynamic interest in passive and active solar house heating that developed in the period surrounding World War II. And I've sort of placed two tasks before me. Uh, first, to describe this solar impulse, <clears throat> to document it and present it to you, as this information has largely been lost to the history of architecture. And second, to place this impulse in the context of a broader discussion around images, speculations, possible futures, and perhaps even utopias as they played out in the period. Does that work? Oh, there we go. So I'm using the phrase a solar impulse very intentionally insofar as it is, it, it is invoked by Frederick Jameson in his interpretation of Ernst Bloch's The Principle of Hope, that is Bloch's reading of Thomas More's Utopia. Jameson here identifies what he calls, uh, quote, two distinct lines of descendancy from More's original text. The one intent on the realization of the utopian program the other, an obscure yet omnipresent utopian impulse finding its way to the surface in a variety of covert expressions and practices, end quote. This latter tendency, the impulsive one that you see on the right, is generally derided, consisting, uh, as Jameson continues, of, quote, liberal reforms and commercial pipe dreams, where utopia serves as the mere lure and bait for ideology, end quote but that still offers at times uh, to, quote, continue, uh, sorry, it offers at times to turn into a conscious utopian project. 
I won't claim such a clearly focused trajectory in the solar houses that I'm going to describe, but I'm interested in the potential for the accumulation of these details as they threaten to articulate, if not precisely a utopian program, then at least something of an alternative trajectory, not only for architecture, but indeed for a broader sense of an energy metabolism of social relationships to technology and for how dynamic conditions connecting societies and biomes offer many different ways of life, many projected totalities, many possible futures. In this sense, we can also note, as Jameson writes, quote, while the city is the fundamental form of the utopian image, perhaps we should make a space for the individual building as a space of utopian investment, that monumental part which cannot be the whole and yet attempts to express it. Okay, so with all of that in mind, I want to start with this house, or really this drawing, right? This image of a house, an image precisely of a possible future that, while speculative, while certainly fictive, was nevertheless rooted in, related to, and developed out of a set of design and technological tendencies. A speculative image that developed in relationship to a real set of built objects, but that is sort of set apart because of its claims to distinction, precisely its fictive qualities, if you will, how they operate, still following more via Block, via Jamison, as a moat, right, as we've already seen in the island, a sort of moat surrounding the image, separating, separating it from its present and placing it in a distinctly, possibly utopian space of difference. And I keep thinking of this sort of gold enshrouded oval as our own little moat here that we should all be kind of securing ourselves within. Uh, but we'll leave that for now. Okay. So uh, this image appeared as a sort of sidebar, again, kind of off to the side, separated, right, by a moat, uh, in an article written by Eric Hodgins, published in Fortune magazine in September of 1953, the article entitled Power from the Sun. It appeared next to the caption, as you see, a not-so-utopian future. So it was already kind of very self-conscious of its speculative nature, also activated a specific genre relative to the utopian impulse, a sort of negative utopia, or really a kind of not-so-utopian presence, a kind of quasi-utopia, uh, either maybe a little utopian, right, but not as utopian as some other possible utopias, uh, or not so utopian at all, in fact, something quite distinct from the more pleasant visions that the term utopia might invoke, although that we've already kind of productively complicated. Uh, perhaps a dystopia, but again, not quite, right? Uh, or somehow uh, kind of a little of all of these, right? So this is kind of the conundrum that we're facing. It's not uh, very utopian, as opposed to some other ideas, maybe in the body of the article, maybe relative to Fortune magazine more generally, the journal of record of the utopia called capitalism, where everyone's needs are met by the invisible hand of the market, right? So this sort of less utopian or kind of less absolutely so. I'll say some more about this article uh, and the author in a moment, but first let's kind of stay with this house, this image of the house, what exactly is going on here? It shows a simple one-story house on what appears to be an indistinct suburban lot, right? Uh, more or less of the size typical then, though already becoming less so, and certainly uh, not anymore, right, in terms of the size of the suburban home, uh, but typical then of a house for a small family. We don't have a plan, but we can speculate it contains bedrooms for parents, probably two kids living areas and kitchens, bathrooms, storage, etc. The American dream, perhaps, or one version of it. There's a sort of greenhouse in the back. You can see uh, maybe a three-season room, uh, covered porch for dinner. We're not quite sure what its use might be. The front of the building, as we see, faces south. And let's see, how does this work? Okay. So this is you know, an important indication, very clear kind of arrow pointing south, uh, with an overhang protecting the porch that, as the illustration shows, shades the sun. Oh, wrong button. That work? Yeah. Uh, shades the sun, right? You see these sort of shadow delimitations, right? It shades the sun in at least some aspects of its diurnal and seasonal patterns. And we see here it's shading some of the windows in a glass door. Our attention, of course, is focused even more so on the roof uh, and then even more on the cutaway perspective that seems to be, uh, you know, the kind of focus of the image that seems to be a rather elaborate addition to the technological appliances characteristic of the post-war kitchen. The kitchen, of course, was a primary figure in the post-war period of spatial, domestic, and technological innovation, right? This sort of figure of innovation, important space simultaneously for the astounding conservatism of gender roles characteristic in the period, and also the sort of space for the sorts of technological appurtenances that were seen as some of the most important benefits of the transformation of wartime technological prowess into domestic technological opportunity, right? So again, a space sort of cordoned off 
behind a cultural moat, if you will, uh, both teasing out aspects of the past in this kind of Neanderthal-esque gender assumptions, right? Uh, even here in Pierre Koenig's Stahl House, uh, case study house number 22, one of the most famous houses from the period, uh, where in the dynamic open plan, the kitchen is delimited not even by walls, right, but only by this kind of raised floor and drop ceiling. Uh, even here, the basic post-war principle of the kitchen as a gendered space, women in, men out, right, is rendered apparent in this photograph. Even kind of this allegory of like, you know, he can peek in what she's peeking into, right, but there's kind of this, you can't come in, right, not quite. So again, kind of not so utopian kitchen, if you will, a space mired in the past and also a space of the future relative to the elaborate technologies that were imagined throughout the house but actually began to play out most effectively in the kitchen in this period. Uh, the kitchen as a sort of experiment in technological ways of modern living. So I'm gonna talk for a minute about technological trajectories and kitchens and domestic appliances more generally just as a way to kind of give us clear access to this not so utopian future that was being imaged and imagined in the immediate post-war years. And concerns over technical, technological trajectories and their relationship to family life, as I'm sure many of you know, in full infused post-war culture generally, and were organized, uh, generally speaking, around the house. In this famous photograph from Life magazine in 1946, uh, conveniently titled Family Utopia, uh, we see these numerous technological advances of relevance to domestic life arrayed on the lawn, a sort of symbolic national moving day out to the suburbs, right? Of course, many of them are focused on the kitchen, the sink and the dishwasher unit, right? The sort of compact uh, sink and dishwasher, the oven and the stove, the refrigerator in the very back, you can probably see right in front of the house. The washing machine, though no dryer, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, some of these perhaps more for the closet than the kitchen, this sort of planimetric challenge of the laundry room, right, that also emerges in this period uh, when space is limited or relatively so in the not so utopian future one imagines you could at least kind of put the washer in the kitchen. So we include that right in the catalog. <clears throat> uh, but again, no clothes dryer and yet the helicopter hovering above, right? Andrew Schenken has recently referred to the strange proliferation of the personal helicopter in post-war speculative images, such as this one, as an anticipatory tease, right? A potent symbol for all the benefits that wartime production was going to bring to the home front once everything had sort of returned to order. Uh, the benefits that the sort of terrors of war could offer to domestic life, or at least to the domestic imaginary. Ralph Rapson's Greenbelt House, case study number four, uh, this image drawn in 1944, uh, very early in the case study project, uh, but never built, or, or actually only built in 1989 as part of Elizabeth A.T. Smith's exhibition uh, of, on, on the case study houses called Blueprints for Modern Living at LACMA, right? This house was first constructed for that museum event. Uh, so anyway, this, this sort of uh, complex relationship already, right, in terms of these kind of pasts and futures and speculative images and, and these kind of various moats. Uh, but in, in this case, we see Rapson image, Rapson's image also has a helicopter, a bit sort of shaded in the background here, but even more prominently in this other one, uh, uh, makes the subtle challenges of figuring or sort of speculating as to possible futures quite explicit. Uh, Dolores Hayden in the catalog for the case study uh, exhibition I just briefly mentioned echoes uh, Esther McCoy's much earlier critique in referring to Rapson's drawings as, quote, sketches of the post-war family programmed for divorce. The husband commuted to work in a helicopter while the wife hung wash on the clothesline, uh, end quote, bereft, as we see, of the uh, almost ubiquitous, soon to be ubiquitous, right, uh, clothes dryer. The concerns over technology infused the design culture of the post-war period. This is sort of part of the larger point, making its connection to the wider culture even more compelling. This Greenbelt house uh, deserves a little attention as well, and, and it was all the same despite this sort of programming for divorce, an interesting project as Smith and Hayden and McCoy obviously recognized. I don't know if it's familiar. Uh, it's not kind of quite part of the modernist canon, right, but uh, uh, relatively well known. It's a relatively simple house, a sort of template for a certain type of purportedly simplistic straightforward, almost obvious framework for post-war living. Uh, two uh, horizontal bars, right, as we see, oh, I keep doing that. Two, you know, we see these bars in the plan, one of them programmed for public uses, kitchens again and dining rooms and sitting areas, the other bedrooms, bathrooms, this kind of family salon with the piano. <clears throat> uh, 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 okay, so, and then of course the real interest in the sort of place where the house gets its name, this interior uh, green belt. Um, 
So the real interest is the green belt itself, the quasi-utopian space of the house, delimited, demarcated, set off from the world, though still a part of it, sort of bringing the outside world inside, right? Rapson imagined this as a very unique space, uh, the, the designer of the house, uh, in which the family would have the spatial opportunity, opportunity to explore a new way of living most appropriate to their desires, right? The green belt could, Rapson wrote, uh, quote, have a large amount of planting or very little, perhaps none. It may be a rather a regular digestible garden or graveled area with small pool, countless possibilities. The most important aspect of the green belt, he continues, uh, lies in its personality, the personality that each family will give it. Here, the individual may grow, and the sort of dachshund probably has some potential there too, but in any event, uh, sort of following Hayden and McCoy, some individuals, uh, and again, the sort of gendered condition of the post-war house laid clear, perhaps, in this kind of mansplaining image, right? I mean, even the, even the, the boy is riding around on a tricycle while the kind of teenage girl is doing the planting, right? You know, I mean, it's a very strange sort of world that Rapson creates for us. But, but nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, some sense of, uh, of uh, some possible future is being uh, sort of prescribed within this um, not-so-utopian space, which, of course, also has a nice, nice kitchen. Uh, so let's, you know, hang on to the kitchen for one more second. Uh, in Rapson's drawings, without a clothes dryer, a sort of renewed appreciation, I think, for Ruth Schwartz Cohen's thesis in her landmark text, More Work for Mother, the Ironies of Household Technology from the Open Hearth to the Microwave, I hope a sort of essential text of all, in all of our bibliographies written in 1983. Uh, that demonstrates that strangely as the domestic space became more infused with technology, cultural expectations also transformed, leading to further exaggerations in the divisions of labor. The kitchen of sort, of course, the site for all sorts of fantasies, speculations, and a site for the display of misgivings, right? This image designed as a kind of tongue-in-cheek promotion for the Scheibel Corporation. Uh, they make the drain inserts, right, with those fancy little pull tabs, so it's kind of a drain, but it's not a drain, right? Another kind of utopia, maybe. Um, uh, this kind of notion that, that this kind of slightly paranoid image of the kitchen of the future, uh, of the near future, right? And this is very much a kind of Bucky Fuller future, a future that um, you know, mid-century architectural historians, or historians of mid-century architecture are quite familiar with. We see the Dymaxion car, of course, the helicopter, um, uh, kind of requisite, almost kind of hovering around, just waiting for somebody to, to pay attention. Uh, and then even these Dymaxion houses, uh, but fully glazed, unlike the ones that uh, were actually produced. Um, uh, uh, right, yeah, this helicopter hovering around still, a sort of signifier of, of many possibilities. So, I mean, it's a compelling image, either despite or because of its ironic self-positioning, an image of the future at once stirring and frightening, uh, the housewife significantly augmented in her technologically astute faucet cockpit, right, where she has access to these new forms of meal production from seeds to chemicals, pre-dehydrated pre food from the processor, as well as to the pots and pans and other kitchen antiques, right, that are still of relevance given their kind of prominent site of display, uh, uh, if perhaps rarely used, although she's kind of grabbing for something, right. Um, a different sort of consideration of the technological extensions of the body, a sort of gentle, docile cyborg as a complement to the empowered, militarized workforce of the gray flannel suit returning from abroad to protect the home. And I think we can almost envision, envisage right, the kind of alternate ICBM attachment right, for when the kind of Russians come, these turn into a sort of more of a projectile uh, sort of system, uh, able to prepare dinner while still defending the home front. And all the while, the baby comfortable in its enclosed rocker, cooing away at the reflections of the life unfolding before her. This image, and, and perhaps some of you recognize that it, it was in uh, Siegfried Gideon's Mechanization Takes Command, as an indication of the sort of cynicism with which many approach the technological kitchen and all that it implied. Okay, so there's a lot about kitchens in the post-war period. Uh, one could go on. I mean, the Eames kitchen sort of representative of some other things. Uh, perhaps Frank Lloyd Wright's communal kitchen, an interesting moment in Taliesin West, a somewhat more nuanced technological disposition. Also, of course, a communal space, uh, though here right before the war in a sort of brief utopian moment of the 1930s, maybe the kind of architectural culinary equivalent of the popular front, right? A moment when men and women worked in the kitchen together uh, here, of course, in the service of the master, Frank Lloyd Wright. And if we were to write a post-war history of the kitchen, and, and perhaps someone already has, in which case I apologize, but uh, 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 if we were to write it, it would begin, no doubt, with the Frankfurt kitchen, I'm sure well known to all of you, uh, potentially being deaccessioned by MoMA, so if anybody needs a kitchen, you know, there you go. Um, 
Uh, and it might end, or at least reach an important section break with the kitchen debate, right? A bit after the moment I'm discussing. Uh, uh, but in the staunch faces here of Nixon and Khrushchev, a sense of the importance of the purported technological efficiency of the kitchen, the domestic workspace, as a symbol of different possible futures as they relate to their various, various geopolitical organizations. A clear indication, again, of the politics embedded in the reproduction of the systems of production. OK, so back to this kitchen, uh, this sort of adjunct expansion to the kitchen in the not-so-utopian house, and the roof which relates to it. What, what, again, was going on here? The idea was this, right? That solar energy, energy from the sun, just kind of as it passes through the sky, would heat the house uh, through the south-facing windows. The house also had the capacity on the roof <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry, had the house also had the capacity, as the author Eric Hodgins puts it, to, quote, grow its own food in the form of algae on the roof on the assumption that the day is coming when population pressures will make wheat fields and cattle ranges luxuries of the dear dead past, end quote. The house attempts thereby a complete survival system for a family of four, a closed world in the sense of an isolated system operating on its own terms and prefiguring, of course, the survival ecologies and architectures of the 1970s. In this pantry, uh, garbage was burned to charge the algal suspension and keep it growing. This algae was then filtered, reheated, and made available as, uh, to quote again, a concentrated sludge, a dark green paste with a pleasant grassy odor, uh, and enough fresh organic manner to supply the entire protein requirements for the family, end quote. In the not too far future, Hodgins here concluded, uh, to quote again, we will come to rely not only on these technologies and related innovations, but also on the internal metabolic adjustments by which we shall subsist contentedly on hydrolyzed sawdust and pre-digested vitaminized algae. End quote. So, so, you know, more work from other indeed. The key word in that, of course, is contentedly, right? As the house is simultaneously embedded in the monumental totality of world creation, right? This kind of territorial program. Um, uh, but, but, but as, as we'll also see it in this sort of allegorical process, as Jameson, of course, is focused on, in which various utopian figures seep into the daily life of things and people. In this not-so-utopian future, serious perhaps only on its allegorical terms, metabolic adjustments and changing conceptions of the psychological, physiological and biological makeup of humans would allow them to adapt to this parched earth, right? Uh, so this image is imbued with a mixture, I think, of irony, paranoia, and caution, suggestive of a much broader image economy that I'm going to glimpse for just a moment uh, from which it emerged and to which it sort of cycles back to, uh, some aspects of which we've, we've seen a, a piece of. But what I want to attend to now is how this sort of total system, again, kind of seeps into these more quotidian proposals. So uh, the image was drawn, uh, as I've noted, for, uh, illustrated, as the caption stated, for Fortune's visually minded readers as part of the article entitled Power of the Sun by Eric Hodgins, already noted in late 53. Hodgins was an editor of Fortune. He had also been publisher at Time during the war, and he presented a rather sophisticated analysis, decrying not only the potential disappearance of cattle ranges, but also the, quote, strange socio-industrial lethargy, end quote, that inexplic inexplicably stood in the way of more effective technological engagement with solar power. Hodgins had just finished contributing to and editing a very loaded early Cold War document called Resources for Freedom, published in 1950, February 1952. It was the public report produced out of President Truman's Materials Policy Commission, also known as the Paley Commission, which Truman had convened in late 49 in order to assess, as the report put it, the combined material requirements and supplies of the entire free non-communist world, right? So this kind of notion that the kind of ex ex uh, expansion of uh, American influence required a sort of resource analysis to make its, its boundaries clear. Hodgins had also, in 1946, written the novel uh, Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House, a not-so-satirical tale about the trials and tribulations of working with an architect to build a house in the country, made into a film, as we see here, starring Cary Grant and Myrna Loy in 1948. Melvin Douglas plays the architect Henry L. Sims, who is alternately, al alternately assisting them or leading them to ruin, all along with strong innuendo uh, that he is also romancing Loy's character. 
And you know, I think the bland, this, this film uh, should be required viewing for, for all architecture students, if only to master this sort of architect smirk that seems to be in all of these uh, promotional uh, photographs. Uh, Hodgins had himself tried to build a house in Milford, Connecticut in the late 1930s, only to see the budget more than quintuple from 11,000 to 59,000 over the three year building process. He had to sell it at significant loss to recoup what he could. Ironically, uh, after the film was such a hit, he tried to buy his dream house back in 1950, but the current owners wouldn't part with it. Uh, many critics saw the film as a necessary check, a sort of critical glaring view on what was by the late 1940s, the relatively uncritical process of suburban expansion. Uh, and the Cary Grant character ends up wishing he would have kept his daughters in the city. You can kind of read that in there, glares, right? I'm trying to point to a broad and I hope somewhat nuanced, if you know, also slightly humorous picture of the cultural forces and ideas around architecture, technology, and energy, uh, and different images and ideas about ways of living in the future, a sort of range of total worldviews, utopian or otherwise, that preoccupied architects, policymakers, editors such as Hodgins and many others in the period. The not-so-utopian house was embedded in these many possible futures, either enduring the glare of your disappointed teenage daughters uh, or parallel to the careful calculations of resources and their geopolitical conditions, as here, these flows and potential limitations to them. Indeed, much of the anxiety that led to the various resource anxieties we've already uh, articulated was instigated over the winter of 1947 and 48, a very chilly winter, when due to a haphazard array of supply bottlenecks and infrastructure failures, a a large swath of the populated Northeast went low on heating oil with little sense of when it would return. So part of the kind of instigation to the resources for freedom and other reports was this sense that we were running out of oil. And of course, a lot of this due to lack of knowledge. I mean, if the Middle Eastern sort of bar was accurate to the existing reserves, it would you know, go up to this to third or fourth floor. I, mean, I don't know how many floors you actually have in that thing, right? But high up. Uh, the period from the end of the war until about 1953, which is to say until the extent of these Middle Eastern reserves became known, was one of significant concern over the future availability of energy resources. As with the appliances of the post-war kitchen, technological resource research into alternate energy was seen as both a major domestic project and also central to the promotion of world peace. Annalies such as these by M. King Hubbard, whose theory of peak oil is relatively well known, uh, began to sort of elaborate, again, on this kind of aesthetic of, of trajectories of decline, right? I mean, in this image, this is kind of played out with a bit more finesse in terms of the way that these lines uh, indicate the possible futures of civilization, uh, this kind of rise and fall of energy availability, right, in the kind of small little period that we're living within uh, still today. Eugene Ayers, a director of research at Gulf Oil, also saw this moment as an opportunity to explore different forms of, of uh, energy sources based in accumulated energy store, I'm sorry, also saw this moment as an opportunity to explore different forms of energy generation and to encounter this relationship between energy technology and social systems. Ayers proposed, as you see here, to distinguish, or no, you kind of see it here, but he proposed to distinguish between capital energy sources based in accumulated energy stored underground and income sources, geothermal, uh, solar, and wind that could be used on a continuous rather than a time to completion basis. And use these terms, you know, these capital and income terms were adopted by Hodgins in his article uh, in Fortune for obvious reasons. These investigations into possible technological trajectories hummed with this notion that a combination of ingenuity and social adaptation would not only lead to new routes out of the seemingly dire circumstances of energy depletion, but also to previously unforeseen benefits for social institutions and cultural production. Architecture, and the solar house in particular, was, as I've already suggested, an important lens through which to make this perspective on energy more precise, right? So it sort of becomes this discursive space where these questions around energy uh, are really sort of brought to bear. Uh, when Ayers published his analysis in Scientific American, as we see here, uh, he titles the article Windows. And, and though it seems that thereby he might have been thinking of some of these houses by George Fred Keck, uh, these solar houses, passive solar houses, then relatively uh, uh, proliferating quite wildly across the Midwest with this kind of simple formula, right? These kind of narrow bar buildings with uh, open glazed facades, allowing, uh, with this carefully measured uh, uh, eave here, right? Um, oh my God. <laughs> this carefully measured overhang to keep the, let the sun come in in the winter, as we also see here, but block it out in the summer, right? And this is, I think, what, two or three keystrokes today, right? It took them about three and a half months uh, to clarify the precise length of that eave. Um, uh, we could also, 
Uh, I, yeah, here's an image that Ralph, Ralph Rapson, who was in Keck's office, drew, just to sort of keep us honest. And, and referring back to Professor Chaplin's talk earlier today, here are some pyroheliometric readings, right, of the interior of these solar spaces, showing that there's still solar energy even when the shades are drawn, right, even when it's cloudy out. Um, this interest in passive solar houses preoccupied the American architectural profession. Solar house heating was the subject of numerous competitions, exhibitions, marketing campaigns, policy proposals, and publications. Uh, we can see here Lou Kahn's house that I'm obligated to show as a professor at uh, Pennsyl University of Pennsylvania, uh, and also other houses that you might be familiar with, uh, the Jacobs House on top and uh, our, our local uh, nearby uh, Harkness House by Tack, right? Both kind of demonstrating this felicitous opportunities to engage with uh, the solar experience of the outdoors. And even, you know, we could even sort of take this further to Philip Johnson's model for a passive house that was uh, displayed in Ladies Home Journal in 1945 and part of an exhibition in 1946 that was sort of engineered towards uh, soldiers returning home from the war front and thinking about ways of living in the suburbs, right? A whole array of, of photographs and images and models that were produced and that as you can, if you can read it on the top and the top left there for Frank, Lloyd's right, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright's design where it is purported to have, quote, far reaching effects on future living for all of us. If passive solar house heating was a widespread, if not in fact ubiquitous aspect of this modern, uh, ar modern residential architecture after the war, Ayers and his colleagues, despite his title of windows, was more interested in the array of active solar heating systems that were also on the table. Here, of course, in the period before photovoltaics, these active systems were using water or chemical systems to absorb heat and store it for use, the kind of basic principle to let the sun shine during the day and then use that heat to warm the house in the evening. Evening. A uh, number of projects play out on these terms, a lot of them at MIT or sort of related to it, the one we just saw, and then uh, this house being built in Dover, Massachusetts. Uh, and, you know, many of these sort of not only uh, in entertaining to the architectural establishment, but as you see, sort of uh, uh, manifest across a number of different forms of, of media discussions here in popular science. There are many others. Uh, the engineer George Loft built three houses using river pebbles for storing heat that uh, had also been a sort of part of his overlapped plate collector. I'm just going to kind of run through a few of these because we won't get into the details. Um, the Department of Commerce, U.S. Department of Commerce, Commerce architect Charles Shaw collaborated with the solar engineer John Yellett to develop a demountable solar house that toured with trade shows across North Africa. Yellett also helped to organize an international competition for a solar house through an industry organization called the Association for Applied Solar Energy in 1958. And you can uh, get some sense of some of those drawings. The winning entry is there on the bottom right. Uh, further experiments at MIT, led by architect, uh, architecture professor and later Dean Lawrence Anderson, sought to determine the ideal building shape for solar heat absorption, ranging from subtle variations on familiar modern profiles to more targeted proposals to rethink spatial conditions of domestic life in order to maximize solar gain in solar and storage area, right? So this image here, that's kind of, this is how, you know, the kind of maximized solar house could look, a very sort of non-traditional form uh, of, of living, right? Uh, Anderson and a student designed MIT's Solar House 4, built into a berm to increase insulation and with a huge water-based solar array and a solar stove uh, for cooking uh, hot dogs on the lawn, weather permitting, right? Another sort of reimagination of the gendered technospatial politics of the post war kitchen. Indeed, uh, solar stoves, ovens, and other devices proliferated in the period, in most cases reinforcing, as we see here, not only the sort of complexities of gender stratifications, but also the emergent economic and technocultural contrast between industrialized and developing economies including the implicit conditions by which development was no longer seen as a transitive state. So I've tried in the time of Loud to map out some of the complexities by which energies and technologies came to be implicated in images and narratives of architecture and utopia in the immediate post-war period. Much more, of course, could be said the technological trajectories of solar energy have really only been touched on, a perspective, I hope, opened up to allow for some new frameworks for understanding this period and what was at stake. 
And if I allowed myself to get a bit perhaps distracted by the technological vicissitudes of the kitchen and the allure of a number of dream houses, it's been in order, I think, both to assess the effects of this not so utopian image economy, these allegorical figures opening specific pathways for growth and social transformation, and also to gesture towards the monumentality of the quotidian. The importance, in other words, in discussions of kitchens, flows of oil, uh, the potential of solar technologies, and no doubt many other things, uh, the importance of a sort of historical discursive impulse to draw together these covert ex expressions and practices to return to Jameson, and to see these events as signposts scattered across the historical landscape, pointing us in new directions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barber. Our second speaker this afternoon is Professor Sarah Richard. She's Associate Professor in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. She's the author of Confluence, The Nature of Technology and the Remaking of Their Own, and co-editor of New Natures, Joining Environmental History with Science and Technology Studies. She has recently received a grant from the National Science Foundation to support her new research project, which examines the history and politics of environmental light pollution. Her talk today is entitled Enviro Envirotechnical Utopias. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Pritchard. We'll see if I can work. Ah, oh, the big button, all right. Insert joke here about historians of technology and, and technology. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and also uh, Liz for the logistical arrangements. Um, before I came to the workshop, I thought I should start with a caveat, maybe a big caveat, that I'm not a designer, architect, landscape architect, archite architectural theorist or historian thereof, and I don't walk, work on utopias. Um, so I was worried that I would feel a bit like a fish out of water, which might be a good metaphor given what I'm going to be talking about today. But now that I'm here, I really don't think the caveat is, is necessary. Um, although I'm situated primarily in environmental history, the history of technology and science studies and their nexus, there have been already so many synergies across the papers and disciplines, um, only some of which I'll nod to as I go along. Um, but one synergy is my partner and I built a passive solar house in 2013-14, so there you go. <clears throat> and maybe that will move forward. All right, here we go. Large-scale technological systems played central roles in the reconstruction and modernization of France after World War II. In this paper, I want to examine the utopian fantasy of high modernist control of nature by examining the history of the transformation of France's Rhone River. Building on work in environmental history, the history of technology in STS, I suggest that technology like large dams on the Rhone, seen here, is already inflected by a utopian vision of environmental separation and control. Alternatively, envirotechnical analysis highlights the complex, dynamic, and sometimes unexpected entanglement of environmental and technological systems, thereby resisting problematic binaries and techno-optimism. So my first book, Confluence, explored the remaking of France's Rhone River since 1945. And in the book, I make two main arguments, one historical, one theoretical. Historians have demonstrated the importance of technology to, to France, and particularly French national identity, and we've seen that already over the last two days. Building on this work, I traced how environmental management and technological development shaped nation building, both materially and culturally, during the second half of the 20th century. Theoretically, I integrated insights from environmental history and the history of technology to complicate the place of technology in the former field and non-human nature in the latter, question such dichotomies, challenge established accounts of technological change, and ultimately emphasize the complicated dialectical relationships between what we usually call nature and technology. I synthesized such arguments under the broad heading of envirotechnical analysis, which I'll discuss a little bit more at the end of my talk. The transformation of the Rhone entailed the remaking of space on several scales from the local to the transnational. High chute dams, nuclear power stations, and extensive irrigation networks reshaped the Rhone and its proximate environment. 
Construction of large-scale projects involved extensive land expropriation and earth and river moving equipment, which you can see here. Engineers and workers from the Compagnie Nationale du Rhône, or CNR, the part public, part private company founded in 1934 and charged with developing or amenager the river for energy, navigation, and irrigation, literally remade the Rhône when they conceptualized and then implemented what they called the Rhône formula. And you can see uh, one schematic of this. This is a recent schematic. It's not the CNR schematic, but it gives you a sense of what um, their, their development model looked like. Um, and their de development model entailed constructing a long linear channel known as a diversion canal, placing a hydroelectric plant and locks on this canal, and allowing a reservoir to build up upstream. In the case of Donzère Mondragon, the CNR's first post-World War II project, the agency diverted approximately 96% of the river's flow through the project's 16-mile-long diversion canal. Donzère Mondragon illustrates how the CNR channelized, simplified, and aimed to control a river that had ebbed and flowed, flooded and meandered over centuries. Such efforts had profound effects on the local scale. The remaking of the Rhone reached well beyond, however, the seeming boundaries of any single project, say, like Donzère Mondragon. From its inception, the CNR planned to harness the entire French Rhone from the Swiss-French border to the Mediterranean Sea. In the immediate post-World War II era, the CNR focused on the central and lower Rhone, the reach from Lyon to the Mediterranean. This was the span of the river with the greatest hydroelectric potential due to its ample flow. The CNR did not turn to the upper Rhone, the reach of the river between Lyon and Switzerland, until the 1970s and 80s. These projects were smaller, in part because of the Rhone's diminished flow there, and also in, due, in part due to the different historical context of development. Not all projects initially envisaged by the CNR's technical committee in 1935 were actually built, but most were, and from the outset, the CNR conceptualized the Rhone in its entirety as a roughly 300-mile-long river within the po political boundaries of France, with 18 multi-purpose projects eventually brought to fruition, and you can see those marked here. CNR engineers argued that any single project needed to be understood in relation to other actual and potential projects. Through such thinking, the CNR and similar agencies, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority in the United States, contributed to the emergence of integrated water management and watershed management over the 20th century. Yet the Rhone's remaking transformed space well beyond the River Valley. The Rhone's transformation recalls Wallerstein's center periphery and offers, one might think of a, a, an aquatic version of Cronin's city hinterlands in nature's metropolis. Dating back to the late 19th century, the city of Paris had inadequate electricity, not only for a growing metropolis, but also consumers' rising energy demands. Power lines meant sites of energy production, though, could be separated from sites of consumption, facilitating the transfer of electricity from more energy-rich regions like the Rhone Valley to energy-intensive centers like Paris. Indeed, the French state cited metropolitan needs, among others, when it justified and approved the development or management of the Rhone in 1921 and created the CNR in 1934. But energy demands took on new significance after World War II. After the Second World War, France was desperate for all forms of energy, including electricity. The Rhone's hydroelectric dams, and especially Donzère Montagon, provide critical energy for the material and, and cultural reconstruction of France in the immediate aftermath of the war. And we could certainly analyze this image of the turbine room of Donzère Montagon um, as a cathedral space, and it certainly echoes Etienne's presentation yesterday. Um, and there were many postcards. Um, uh, Atea showed us some yesterday, and we just saw some images, imaginaries right now. We could certainly unpack these as both documents and fantasies about uh, development, in this case, river development in post-war France. Some electricity was used by communities and industries in the surrounding valley. And this was especially true once France began developing a nuclear power program. One of the earliest facilities was Marcoul, so located in the, the southern Rhone Valley. Somewhat ironically, nuclear power stations needed substantial reliable electricity, or in this case hydroelectricity, sources to operate. These stations in turn produced still more electricity, this time nuclear generated. But the Rhone's power could also be transferred to sites well beyond the river's watershed like Paris. 
As the brief example of Paris suggests, the remaking of the Rhone was connected to wider transformations in and beyond France, including regionalization within the nation state, empire and decolonization, and European integration. Um, so there's some interesting issues here around kind of the objects of what we study, in my case, dams here, um, and the broader context, historical, cultural, political context, with, but which both um, Anna and John asked about yesterday in the, in the session. So historians of France have teased out center periphery relations between Paris and the so-called provinces, the rural hinterlands of France that were eventually encompassed into the monarchy and later the nation state. Intellectual, political, and cultural elites in France saw several regions, including those in southern France, as backward provinces in desperate need of modernization. Um, and this we could think of as a form of internal colonization, which we heard about in Latin America this morning. In their view, new ample supplies of electricity and expanded irrigation infrastructure, both supplied by harnessing and regularizing the Rhone, promised to jumpstart stagnant rural economies in the surrounding region. Engineers and agricultural specialists believed energy and irrigation were vital to the modernization of provincial farming. For such experts, the value and meaning of water was heightened given that they often described much of southern France as a desert, and this is a literal metaphor they used. These characterizations were quasi-scientific descriptions of a semi-arid landscape, but more significantly, they were simultaneously evaluations of the region's political economy and also its potentiality. Water from the Rhone, they hoped, would make this desert bloom. Indeed, technical and political elites hoped that transforming the Rhone would in turn facilitate the creation of a new hub of economic and agricultural growth in a triangle reaching from Lyon in the north to Toulouse in the west and the Italian border in the east. And the core of this triangle was the Rhone. Proponents of regional economic development called this triangle Le Grand Delta, seamlessly but strategically conflating hydrologic, politic, political, and economic boundaries. This regionalization of the Rhone was connected to two other contemporaneous historical processes. The Algerian War both reflected and catalyzed France's crisis of empire. It spurred an exodus of French citizens from Algeria and North Africa more broadly, particularly following decolonization in 1962. Many decided to resettle in southern France. Modernization of the Midi therefore took on renewed import in the context of decolonization in the 50s and 60s. Meanwhile, political and technical elites also connected France, uh, excuse me, the Rhone's remaking to wider transformations across Europe. Contemporaries discussed regionalization not only within the context or boundaries of the French nation state, recall this idea of Le Grand Delta centered on the Rhone, but also across European borders. Political and technical elites believe that the Rhone might spur the development of southern France, but also contribute to broader economic growth across all of southern Europe. They hoped that this transnational region of northern Spain, southern France, and northern Italy might offer a counterweight to the German, and to a lesser extension, to extent Dutch, economic engine after World War II. Such arguments clearly reflected anxieties about European economic and political integration, Germany, and the role of France in that transnational union, especially given the humiliation of the war and the recent crisis of empire. Now, what I've given you to hear is a seeming narrative of success. The design, construction, operation of large-scale technological systems to supply power, facilitate navigation, irrigate crops, and modernize urban and rural infrastructure with local, national, uh, local regional, national, and international effects. In some ways, my story is a classic illustration of Jim Scott's high modernism. It suggests contemporary confidence in technology, Elites saw technologies like dams and irrigation infrastructure as techno fixes to political, economic, and social problems. As Gabrielle Hecht has shown, technologies like the Rhone's dams were techno political, technical means to political ends. In many ways, technological artifacts and systems like those at Donzère Mondragon were infused by and materialized a utopian promise of national prestige, nation building, and modernization, but at times their spatial scales shifted to the local, the regional, or the European. And this theme of, kind of the nation and the relationship between technology and the nation has certainly come up a lot in the last day and a half. However, other aspects of the Rhone's remaking after World War II complicate this narrative. Here, technological utopias become unbound, or perhaps in the world, words of Chinua Achebe, things fall apart. Some tensions were socio-political. 
The humiliation and crisis of war spurred anxieties about the grandeur of France. Diverse groups shared a strong interest in reconstructing French radiance or rayonnement, but at times they diverged on the vision of the nation's future. Was France a modern industrial nation? How central were agriculture and rural identity to French national identity? And what exactly did modern or industrial mean? Such frictions can be seen in how state agencies envisioned and negotiated the Rhone's remaking. For instance, the Ministry of Agriculture, the French Atomic Agency, the Commissariat à l'énergie atomique, and the CNR did not necessarily perceive the Rhone and its purpose in the same way. Moreover, local and regional priorities only compounded such disagreements among state actors. And you, we can see the juxtaposition of part of the CNR's project in, in one of the nuclear reactors, Tricasta, in the same landscape here. Given the desperate net need for reconstruction after the war, even basic things like producing massive amounts of concrete to rebuild bombed out buildings and factories, pol political and technical elites prioritized energy production. This commitment meant that the way that the CNR designed its projects favored hydroelectric generation, even though the agency still retained its threefold mandate of energy navigation and irrigation. We can see this priority in two technical design features of the CNR's projects. The creation of this linear lengthy diversion canal on which the hydroelectric plant and locks were located, and the diversion of most of the Rhone's flow through that canal. And recall at Donzère Montlégon, only 4% was left to what they now called, um, to, left to the original riverbed, which they now called, quite tellingly, the former Rhone, or even more tellingly, the dead Rhone. The diversion canal and allocation of the Rhone's flow in this way suited energy, but also navigation interests, mayors, chambers of commerce, and some farmers. But some rural communities believed that agricultural concerns were not adequately addressed by the CNR's technical design. 25 cubic meters per second of the Rhone's flow now passed through more ex extensive, modernized uh, irrigation infrastructure. But nonetheless, some farmers believed energy produc production came at the expense of farming. Certainly, industrial, energy, navigation, commercial, urban, and rural inter interests intersected in complex ways. Sometimes they were in tension with one another, like farmers who believed hydroelectricity was being unreasonably prioritized. Sometimes they complemented one another. After all, improved na navigation might enable f large and small farmers alike to transport their goods to market more easily and quickly and cheaply. However, these weren't just socio-political conflicts, disagreements over the vision and future of France. They were also socio-ecological conflicts. Different groups hoped to remake the Rhone to serve their wider goals, but their technological systems were not necessarily compatible with one another, precisely because a single river could not be all things to all systems simultaneously. Despite the CNR's multipurpose mandate to pursue energy navigation and irrigation, the agency could not maximize all three goals at the same time. The Rhone's integration into multiple technological systems contributed to these tensions among the systems, as well as frictions between the Rhone and the technological systems of which it was now a part. For starters, turbines, locks, and irrigation networks all depended on the Rhone's flow. Yet the river's volume varied seasonally and annually, and now we're in an era of climate change. The CNR might have wanted to maximize hydroelectric generation, and engineers made various technical, really techno-political design decisions in an effort to do so. But low summer flows and unusually low years hindered the realization of such aims. But unusual flow years were only unusual if one assumed a regular constant river flow. In short, as environmental historians have shown in diverse contexts, a dynamic variable nature resisted standardization, simplification, and control. The CNR's remaking of the river also had diverse environmental consequences, including effects on fish, groundwater, and flooding. Engineers and state fish specialists debated how migratory fish populations would, or even could, get upstream given the high chute dams now in their midst. Engineers discussed whether they should allocate more water to the original riverbed, concentrate limited water flow in specific areas, and install a fish ladder. Many fish biologists argued that new species better adapted to the new conditions of the new Rhone should be rather introduced. In essence, they argued that these would be new fish for a new Rhone. Fish biologists both critiqued and shared engineers' high modernist assumptions. 
In addition, rural people in the villages near Donzin Mondragon, farmers, widows, tenant farmers whose land was owned by wealthier families based in Marseille, Lyon, and elsewhere, reported ch strange changes in the land in a remarkable set of letters sent to the CNR. Wells had started to run dry, fissures appeared in the ground, and sometimes houses, barns, and other buildings settled and cracked. Engineers and locals debated the cause or causes of subsidence and shifts in groundwater. Perhaps not surprisingly, most locals held the CNR responsible, pointing to the fact that periodic droughts had never caused such problems before. Meanwhile, the CNR blamed geology and public discourse, while their private exchanges discussed the possibility that their dams in the larger system of which they were a part had indeed altered the flow of water not only in the Rhone itself, but also throughout the surrounding watershed. Locals and engineers also had to contend with floods, and in particular, how flood regimes now interfaced with the new landscape of the Rhone Valley. As I've suggested, the CNR's projects had already altered the Rhone, and therefore how floods would pass through the remade river. During floods, extremely low flows in the former of Dead Rhone or Dead Rhone would suddenly increase, as the original riverbed now channeled any water at or beyond the limits established for the diversion canal. Other technological systems strictly regulated such limits. The placement of several nuclear power facilities on the, Rhone's, or excuse me, on the CNR's diversion canals along the central and lower Rhone further complicated these natural and technological processes. Diverting more water back to the former Rhone attempted to protect the integrity of not only the CNR's hydroelectric plants, but also risky industrial infrastructure. Flood management, flood management policies showed how the incorporation of the Rhone into multiple technological systems created, if not exacerbated, tensions among them, creating new challenges in the process. So to understand, articulate, and theorize these kinds of complex shifting dynamics among people, technology, and the environment, in my earlier work, I developed several related concepts under the umbrella of what I call envirotechnical analysis, which seeks to combine analytic contributions from the history of technology and environmental history. And the first of these concepts is the notion of envirotechnical systems, the historically and culturally specific configurations of entwined ecological and technological systems, which can be composed of artifacts, practices, people, institutions, and ecologies. The concept responds to social constructivism, or really the dominance of social constructivism in the history of technology and STS over the past generation. I still, of course, want to recognize the ways in which social groups shape technology, but this concept incorporates insights from environmental history, instead highlighting how non-human nature can also shape technology. Envirotechnical systems are perhaps more obvious in cases like the Rhone, where overt environmental management technologies like dams and irrigation networks are both enabled and constrained by, quote unquote, nature or the river in this case. But I was, and I guess I still am, trying to make a wider argument about all technologies, that all technologies both shape and are shaped by environmental factors and contexts. Setting that provocation uh, aside, though, if we think envirotechnically, it's really no surprise that hydropower decreases in dry years, or given the catastrophic potential of nuclear, nuclear reactors, rivers are managed during floods in ways to protect these facilities above all else. The second concept that I had developed is the idea of envirotechnical regimes, the institutions, people, ideologies, technologies, and landscapes that together define, justify, build, and maintain a particular envirotechnical system as normative. The main point here is that environmental and technological systems are not linked in just any old way. Rather, the entwining of such systems is strongly shaped by socio-political dynamics. In other words, the particular ways environmental and technological systems intersect suit the interests of some groups and not others. Hopefully, I've already suggested the role of politics in shaping the remaking of the Rhone into envirotechnical system in several ways. For instance, hydroelectric generation was prioritized after World War II. In contrast, if we examine the SCNR's projects from the 1970s and 80s, more of the river's flow was left to the dead Rhone. I guess it wasn't as dead. It was sort of dead, but not totally dead. Uh, the agency also adopted minimal flows by season, increasing flows during periods of, fl of fish migration to try to help the fish. Environmentalism and a stronger envir environmental regulatory role by the state thus shaped or really reshaped the CNR's management of the Upper Rhone. As a result, the CNR designed and operated these projects in ways that attempted to better accommodate non-humans. 
Thus, the envirotechnical system of the immediate post-war period differed from that of the 70s and 80s, and shifting social and political movements help account for those differences. Envirotechnical systems, envirotechnical regimes, and envirotechnical analysis more broadly are clearly scholarly concepts. After all, they're really clunky, clunky jargon. Um, they both reflect an attempt to theorize the new envirotech subfield at the intersection of environmental history and the history of technology. They respond to earlier scholarship that has emphasized the social shaping and environmental effects of technology. Instead, these concepts seek to offer a more complex way of understanding the entanglement of the environmental and the technological. While these are scholarly concepts, it seems to me that they may have more importance in the so-called real world. And here, it may be useful for those involved in, bio, in, in biotechnical analysis like myself to engage with practitioners like designers, architects, landscape architects, engineers, and others. Um, and last night at dinner, we were talking about the dialogue or potential dialogue between design fields broadly and various uh, disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. So we could think about questions like, how do these fields understand and theorize relationships among people, technology defined very broadly, and the environment? Clearly, there's a self-conscious debate within these fields about this, but then there's also parallel debates in other disciplines. So what, what might it mean to put these conversations in dialogue with one another? Um, we can ask, what assumptions do various practitioners make in the design and operation of architectural, urban, engineering, and technological spaces? And how might such assumptions matter in the redesign or design of places like the coastline of New York City in the wake of Sandy, the city of New Orleans, a, now a decade after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, or the Flint River, which I will come back to in a second. In a less known part of Charles Perrault's classic work, Normal Accidents, he articulated the concept not of normal accident, but of ecosystem accident. As he put it, such an accident is the result of, quote, an interaction of systems that were thought to be independent but are not because of the larger ecology. More precisely, quote, ecosystem accidents illustrate the tight coupling between human-made systems and natural systems. There are few to no deliberate buffers inserted between the two systems because the designers never expected them to be connected, end quote. And biotechnical analysis addresses, or at least has the potential to address, precisely this erroneous assumption. Oh, I missed one, we'll jump to here. The recent and ongoing water crisis in Flint, Michigan painfully encapsulates the dangers of this utopian expectation that human-made and natural systems are distinct and will remain so. The unfolding of the Flint crisis has reminded us how urban water uh, infrastructure was center, central to 19th century urbanization, modernization, the hygienic movement, and progressive reform. Engineers and workers laid extensive networks of lead pipes under and through cities uh, in much of North America and Western Europe. That infrastructure, as STS scholars have emphasized, has now been in our midst, albeit usually invisibly, for over a century. Two years ago, the city of Flint tried to reduce its municipal budget by changing the city's water source from Detroit's water purveyor to the Flint River. However, that river had been severely polluted from decades of manufacturing and industrial production. It was no pure nature. It was already a hybrid landscape, a caustic envirotechnical system of its own. And when the river's water then flowed through the city of Flint's existing water infrastructure, the hydrologic and the technological converged in new toxic ways. The Flint River was so contaminated that it started corroding the pipes, allowing lead to leach into the water passing through them and then be ingested by people in the community who consumed that water. This phenomenon powerfully illustrates recent work at the nexus of environmental history and the history of medicine that is focused on the environmental history of the human body and the blurry borders between the human body and the environment. But the tragedy also powerfully demonstrates the fallacy of universal categories like people and human. Flint, of course, is a poor, primarily African-American community in the Midwestern Rust Belt. On the one hand, as many have argued in recent months, we are all Flint. Aging lead pipes in cities throughout the United States are creating a growing infrastructural and human health hazard regardless of race, class, and gender. Economic decline, municipal budget shortfalls, and neoliberalism are creating and exacerbating such crises. And yet we are not all Flint. Local residents complained about the color, smell, and health hazards for months, but they were summarily ignored, even dismissed. These responses thereby increase the temporal and cumulative exposure of Flint residents, foremost children, to lead. The concept of envirotechnical system can help us understand what's going on in Flint. 
a contaminated river and lead pipes brought together in new ways, the environment of human bodies exposed to a dangerous mix of lead, pollution, and river water. Such analysis is useful, but as the stakes of Flint show, it's ultimately inadequate. And this is why I developed the concept of envirotechnical regimes, to explore and emphasize the political context and relations through which environmental and technological systems get connected in specific ways for particular reasons. In brief, to expose the politics of envirotechnical systems. In the case of the post-1945 Rhone, it was to maximize hydropower in the name of the nation. In Flint, poor deindustrializing cities struggle to cover even basic services like water, water. In an era of economic insecurity, rising inequality, lack of commitment to public infrastructure and neoliberalism. Poor communities like Flint are therefore left holding the bag, or in this case, drinking the toxic water. And biotechnical analysis can help us consider how technologies, or technologies as the case may be, are always connected to, dependent on, and constrained by environments, even as they simultaneously transform them. Thinking envirotechnically therefore exposes some of the limits of technology as well as popular and techno-scientific assumptions about technology. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Pritchard. Our last speaker in this panel is Dr. Abby Spinak. She's a History of American Capitalism Fellow in the Charles Warren Center at Harvard. She studies energy history with a particular interest in the politics of energy ownership and the role of infrastructure in disseminating economic ideas. In her current book project, she explores how ideas of economic democracy have shaped the electricity industry in the United States, from New Dealer's vast national plan of development oriented rural electrification to climate change activism in the 21st century. Her talk today is entitled Citizens Along the Lines, Energy Infrastructure, Protest, and the Utopian Urban Imaginary. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ivy Spinak. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, today has been incredibly inspiring and generative, and it reminds me, um, as Joyce Chaplin said this morning, that we should all cross the street more often. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see, it's this big green button. Is that right? The, okay, I'll see if I can work this. So um, I'm also not an architect or a designer, um, so I'm gonna start with a protest. In August, in August 2013, 3,000 protesters marched from the, from the BART subway stop in Richmond, California, to the Chevron refinery on the other side of town. It was the one-year anniversary of a fire at the refinery. A leak on a corroded pipe had ignited and burned for over four hours, spreading a layer of industrial ash over surrounding neighborhoods and sending 15,000 people to the, to the hospital with respiratory problems. The U.S. Chemical Safety Board investigated the incident and determined that the situation was wholly preventable, placing the blame for the fire on the safety culture of Chevron. In light of these findings, the Richmond city government sued Chevron for the first time in the refinery's contentious 100-year history on the Bay. A year later, city officials marched with the protesters to the gates of Chevron. The August protest took as its symbol the sunflower. Sunflowers are good at taking toxic metals out of soil, so protesters carried sunflowers as they walked, and they launched guerrilla gardening-style seed bombs over Chevron's corporate gates. They then painted a 30-foot sunflower on the road in front of the refinery. What is perhaps most striking about this extremely photogenic protest was not its results within Chevron, but its reverberations outside of Richmond. Not only Richmond um, residents and politicians, but environmental justice activists from around the country participated in the march, including environmental writer and activist Bill McKibben. On the morning of the march, Richmond residents were further surprised to see a full-page ad in the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh yeah, I got it to work. Okay, um, to see a full-page ad in the San Francisco the San Francisco Chronicle, paid for by the government of Ecuador, which read, "In the fight against Chevron, the people of Ecuador stand with the people of Richmond." And here is the mayor of Richmond holding up a copy of the ad at the protest. 
In my talk today, I want to delve deeper into, into how the materiality of oil and other energy regimes create the conditions for new political communities. In an era where we talk a lot about local planning and local knowledge, communities are bound materially, not just by proximity, but also as nodes on a, on a supply chain. In the words of protester Jeff Insko in Michigan, who is struggling with a crude oil pipeline project running through his backyard, these are citizens along the lines of the extraction, transport, and processing networks of the energy systems that, under, that undergird the modern world. Environmental humanities scholar Stephanie LeManager calls such communities that form along the lines of, inf of infrastructure networks a political alternative to bioregionalism. Like the common concerns that might bring neighbors together to protect a watershed or local agriculture, people along the supply chains of oil are drawn into a shared material existence, often a conflicted one. We might talk about Richmond, Ecuador, and Michigan as part of an oil shed as opposed to a watershed although many watersheds are themselves constructed in service of infrastructure, as anthropologist Ashley Kars has recently argued about the hinterlands of the Panama Canal. But as opposed to a watershed, where water eventually collects in a river or sea, what pools in oil sheds is capital. What is distributed in oil sheds is pollution. Citizens along the lines of energy networks are thus also citizens at the front lines of political protest who have unique leverage to imagine and promote other infrastructural futures. Yet, of course, it is not that simple in practice. My familiarity with Chevron and Richmond comes from work I did a couple of years ago with an NGO trying to write recommendations for communities living near hazardous energy industries to work out good neighbor agreements. We were pretty naive. Chevron is a multinational corporation that makes more profits every day than the city of Richmond's annual budget. They have sophisticated public relations and political connections, whereas Richmond is one of the poorest cities on the Bay. When you ask about good neighbor agreements in Richmond, residents tell you about the depths of Chevron, of Chevron money in local elections. <laughs> they tell you about the depths of Chevron money in local elections. So forcing companies like Chevron to behave better is a monumental task that requires ongoing creativity and shifting tactics. Understandably, Richmond residents deeply question the viability of private energy companies as legitimate partners in social and environmental stewardship. Henry Clark, the founder of the West County Toxics Coalition, told me, for example, it's not just Chevron. You're talking about Chevron, but it's the corporate world, period. There are some good people within Chevron that want to do the right thing, but I'll put it like this. When you're working for Al Capone, there's only a little you can do to try to fight crime. I did know. At the time, I was also conducting research on alternative forms of energy ownership. In writing my dissertation in urban planning, I had connected with a vibrant community of activists in another energy sector, electricity. Rather than fighting giant corporations, they were focused on cooperative utilities, where the business model relies on distributed, distributed ownership and democratic management. Movements around cooperative energy see current calls for a transition to renewable energy infrastructure as, potentially as a potentially transformative moment, one that opens up possibilities to broadly rethink regulatory institutions and local business practices. In other words, new power for a new political economy. Cooperative energy, at first glance, is an example of what Eric Olin Wright might call real utopias, small-scale alternatives to the dominant capitalist business en environment that could organically grow to eventually challenge the core. The democratic tenets of co-ops certainly make them seem like the corporate opposite of shielded, profit-oriented energy giants like Chevron. Moreover, there is a long history of energy cooperatives in the US. A product of New Deal experimentation with federal credit, Rural electric cooperatives have been in existence for over 80 years. The electric citizenry along the power lines of cooperative utilities stretch across 47 states and make up about 12% of the American population. Yet, digging into the history of the, Amer of the American electricity industry, one quickly discovers that cooperative energy also has a dark side. Many of the citizens along these cooperative power lines are today, like their counterparts in Richmond, fighting not to start electricity cooperatives, but to take control of existing cooperative utilities that have been exploiting the members that they are supposed to serve. 
Their history, as I will talk about more today, is less an alternative to the chevrons of the world than it is a lesson that democratic infrastructure is hard to implement in practice and is easily co-opted. These case studies together invite us to explore energy infrastructure more closely as a world-ordering socio-technical system and to question how societal visions for mechanical power are so often put into the service of undemocratic agendas. So before I delve into the history of electric co-ops, I want to take a step back for a minute and talk about infrastructure as an analytical concept. Then I will go back to the early 20th century and show how electric cooperatives arose as a utopian alternative to the private energy industry. I'll briefly discuss why, instead of creating a vast democratic network of locally controlled energy, this experiment with cooperatives led instead to intensified landscapes of industrial and capitalist development. Finally, I'll come back to Richmond and other recent energy movements to talk about imagining networks of democratic energy that can empower citizens along their lines. Energy, no pun intended, creates power politically, economically, and geographically. And it has done so for a long time. Chevron, for example, is one of the corporate descendants of the Standard Oil Company, John D. Rockefeller's multinational corporate conglomerate, satirized here a few years before it was ruled an illegal monopoly in 1911. This transnational octopus that gave birth to Chevron was a common allegory for infrastructure in the Gilded Age and after. The oil octopus joined earlier critiques of the corrupt monopoly power of the railroad industry. The imagery of tentacles everywhere would again prove useful in the 1920s and 30s in reference to the rapid consolidation and financialization of electric power companies, which Senator George Norris presented, um, which Senator George Norris presented as the holding company octopus in the Senate in June of 1935. Senator Norris didn't have cartoons with him on the floor of the Senate, but as you can see here, um, the, interconnect the interconnectedness of the power industry in diagram form resembled their more aquatic counterparts. How should we think about these cephalopods of industrialization that are our historical legacy, tying us together along oil pipelines, railroads, shipping channels, and globally as citizens in a climate-impacted world? I was asked today to talk about the organization of social space through the lens of utopian urban imaginaries and projects of infrastructure. Indeed, I can think of few things better than infrastructure for addressing this conference's broader goal of investigating the ways in which the imaginary of ideal conditions has been expressed and practiced through the technical mastery of social and environmental space. Infrastructure is a way of inscribing future imaginaries on the landscape. Far from technologically rational response to demand, history tells us that infrastructure projects have largely been built speculatively. The designers have then become boosters who vigorously promote their usage after the fact. Faith in infrastructure as a result of the rational techniques of modernity is thus in many ways buying into someone else's view of the world. Infrastructure, I would argue, is one way of writing utopia. Infrastructure as a subject of critical inquiry is pretty hot right now. Over the last few years, scholars across a variety of fields in the social sciences and humanities have noted with interest a recent infrastructural turn. There have been calls to out infrastructure, to see it as both material assemblage and as social abstraction, as both the glue of urbanization and as a reorganization of nature in service of the flows of a global economy. Infra infrastructure studies is a promising interdisciplinary lens because it can draw together so many different critical perspectives, from the history of technology to political economy, to design, to fiction, and poetry and art. The interdisciplinary critique that this interdisciplinary critique has constructed a solid argument that there is no inherent logic to infrastructure that transcends social and political contingency. Repositioning infrastructure as contested and uncertain outcomes of cultural processes, rather than simply a technical network of physical components, illuminates these socio-eco-technical networks not just as infrastructure, but as contributing to, so to structure in the sociological sense. What Ashley Kars recently referred to as the world-ordering arrangements embedded, embedded in the systems that many of us take for granted. That is, infrastructure systems facilitate certain ways of being in society at the expense of others, create their own distributional logics, and change the rules of the game for gaining and holding power or privilege. 
Susan Lee Starr thus calls on scholars to read infrastructural systems as a kind of master narrative, in that they often speak with a single voice that does not, problem, that does not problematize diversity and speaks unconsciously from the presumed center of things. Paul Edwards likewise argues that infrastructures act like laws and that to live within the multiple interlocking infrastructures of modern societies is to know one's place. Those who study infrastructure tend to be surprised when they look for the origins and evolution of the word. While in our time, infrastructure has come to mean everything from roads, bridges, and pipelines, or as comedian John Oliver sums up, anything that can be destroyed in an action movie, to less material networks like the backbone of the internet, to the supply chain of a company such as Chevron, to the institutional scaffolding of things like democracy. Originally, the word infrastructure was a bookkeeping term. It originated in French railroad engineering as a way to keep track of who owned what. Namely, the French government, that is public funds, were responsible for creating the surveys, plans, surface grading, bridges, and other earthworks to create an appropriate surface for private companies to lay down tracks and ties, or superstructure. Its adoption in English came late. Before the mid-20th century, projects like canals and railroads were referred to in the United States as internal improvements, in Britain as public works. The word infrastructure finally gained popularity in the post-war period, primarily in military operations and international development projects. In other words, infrastructure in an English context is tied to imperialist imaginaries. The tendency of infrastructure projects, as we understand the term today, is to be expansive, to aim to globalize. It is quite literally a, co a concrete way that history is written by the winners. Yet it continues to evolve. In 2012, at a conference held here on landscape infrastructure, Rosalind Williams cautioned that like technology, infrastructure is a recent term, a promiscuous term, one that has no clear definition and that is very liable to reification. It is a rapidly changing term that we have to define in the context of a rapidly changing world. The fluidity of infrastructure as a concept thus yields an invitation to us to use it reflexively as a critical lens to see it as text and as sites of contestation. It is a lens, for example, on the broader processes of urbanization beyond city borders, integral to the creation of networks at a variety of scales and flows of people, things, and capital, and a way of tracing how far-flung places above and below ground have been brought into urban orbits. It is also a lens that reveals contradictory desires for development and unearths visions of society lost to history. These places where infrastructure visions of the future have come into conflict are often some of the most fruitful for us to think about how design and scholarship can be emancipatory. Here, as, urban, here, as Neil Brenner has recently argued, we might start to imagine alter urbanizations. So with this in mind, let's get back to Senator Norris and his holding company, Octopus. By the 1930s, private power companies dominated the US market and had thoroughly captured state regulatory bodies. Worried about the increasing hegemony of private power conglomerates, a strong public power constituency arose in the 1920s. By the 1930s, these public power advocates had little patience with the antisocial tendencies of profit-motivated utilities and were calling for serious regulation, if not replacement. And as you can see here, they were not subtle in their critiques. Dreaming against existing infrastructure, these men and women came up with a number of fascinating plans for alternative electricity projects that would quite literally take power out of the hands of capitalists and distribute it more widely. They would finally win the political leverage to implement some of their ideas during the Great Depression as economic recovery policy. A key target was the vast expanses of rural America that had been long ignored by private utilities. In 1935, the Rural Electrification Administration, or the REA, began under the direction of Morris Cook with a budget of $100 million to loan to rural electrification projects. Now, if you remember the map I showed you earlier, the power poor center of the country is exactly where the REA came in. Nationwide rural electrification was a massive and daunting undertaking that evolved through experimentation. 
After a year of infighting over whether the recipients of federal loans should be public or private entities, the REA had failed to lend almost 90% of the money allocated to them by the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act. At this point, they turned to a third model that was neither public nor private, but a hybrid of the two, the Rural Electric Cooperative. Ultimately, private entities, though communally as opposed to individually owned, Co-ops had many advantages of public power, especially in that the REA was able to dictate through their loan agreements where and how these co-ops would operate. But because they were not public institutions, they had the added benefit that the REA could claim that they were a good deal. Rather than a drain on the national economy, they were an investment. The tax money loaned out would be repaid in full. The REA's approach to cooperatives is worth some reflection because it took a well-known business model that had been widely used in rural America for more radical purposes and transformed it. The REA was not exactly a radical organization, though many within it were sympathetic to the structural critiques of capitalism and the public discourse during the Great Depression. But in practice, REA co-ops arose as much out of political expediency as out of utopian desires for economic democracy. The radical challenge to for-profit electricity would thus remain in contradiction with the REA's more prosaic goal of national economic recovery and growth. I want to take a moment here to focus more on these conflicting social visions in the REA. Here I'm going to paint two portraits of the future imagined by rural electrification advocates during the New Deal. And what I want you to listen for is the intended target and whether or not the means match the ends. On the one hand, electricity had the power to decentralize. The early 20th century American city was one of intensifying industrialization and agglomeration of people from all over, from the unelectrified agricultural countryside, as well as international immigration. Urban reformers worried about the sweatshop and the slum, about the suffering of people in crowded tenements and factories, as well as, less altruistically, the shifting cultural and political landscapes of these industrial cities. Such concerns led rural, rural electricity advocates, such as David Lilienthal, to argue, for example, that, and I'm quoting him, electricity can become a potent force in restoring the order and well-being of our national life. Electricity is flexible and mobile. It can seek the worker at the forest, quarry, and mine. Electricity can help us to eliminate the sweatshop and the slum. It can help us to restore a balance of opportunity between city and country, between the factory and the farm. Lilienthal, in other words, saw electricity as a tool with which to reorganize America according to efficiency and productivity. At the same time, this industrialized countryside would create a broader consumer base. Rural industrialists and modernized farmers reaping the efficiency benefits of, electric, of electrified irrigation husbandry and storage would have larger, more dependable incomes, or so rural electrification advocates argued. Um, and this would allow them to purchase the products of East Coast factories. In fact, Franklin Roosevelt once explained federal financing for rural electrification as a trade agreement between rural and urban America. This was one view of, of rural electrification. Electricity lines would reach out into the countryside, rationalize rural, product, rural production and rural labor, and bring both more fully into the national market. There was a second utopian vision embedded in rural electrification. The mechanism is somewhat the same, improving the plight of burdened manual laborers. But here, the value of electric power was to expand opportunities for cultural and political engagement. So for example, Marianne Ramsey, one of the early directors of the REA Information Division, argued that, and I'm quoting, power production is a political issue. The deeper purpose of democratic government is to assist as many of its citizens as possible, especially those who need it most, to improve their conditions of life. Only thus can the democratic ideal be preserved. Only thus might our nation become a people with enough leisure to enable them to study and to think. And that is where electric power comes in. It may transform men and make them intelligent rulers of their own political destiny. These visions may initially sound compatible, but in practice they represented a deep conflict at the heart of federal rural electrification. The techno-optimism in both is unmistakable, yet one focuses on decentralization of industry and one on the resurgent power of democracy. The utopian vision at the heart of industrial decentralization was a reorganization of the countryside according to principles of scientific land use and technological efficiency for the purposes of a more coordinated and streamlined economy. 
The end of this line of imagining is not increased economic power and leisure time for small farmers, but a reorganization of the countryside for consolidated industrial agriculture, exurban residential sprawl, and the extension of consumer culture. The utopian vision at the heart of the second is more akin to Jeffersonian democracy. Proprietor farmers who farmed in the morning and talked politics in the afternoon, a world that possibly never actually existed outside the minds of urban reformers, and one which certainly could not come into being as the commodity prices of farm products dropped with more efficient mechanized agriculture, and as already economically marginal, as already economically marginal farm families were encouraged to take on debt for wiring, plumbing, and appliances. The REA was not unique in conflating economic productivity with democratic empowerment, but in practice, there is no automatic connection between the two. Unsurprisingly, it was the economic vision that won out. More so than a technological demo democratic utopia, debt-financed rural electrification was an infrastructure project that contributed to the dominance of pathways over settlements, as Rosalind Williams has said about infrastructure more generally. With the REA's focus on efficiency, former livelihoods, supposed to be relieved of their drudgery, were eliminated entirely. In practice, the economic necessities of running capital-intensive utilities and paying back their federal loans led co-ops to support the construction of rural industrial parks, vacation homes, and other high-power experiments, such as the Colorado ski industry. I have thus started to talk about rural electrification as a chapter of cooperative capitalism in the broader evolution of the American economy in the mid-20th century. Designed to bring greater economic productivity, REA co-ops were active institutions in bringing new forms of financialization, consumerism, and growth machine politics into rural America. In practice, co-op democracy came to mean mainly volunteer labor for line building and granting land easements for electricity lines to cross privately held farmland the form of democracy that is self-help, not self-determination. As co-ops expanded and professionalized over the next 80 years, they became even less accessible to their general membership and more connected to professional utility and business networks. By the 21st century, many co-ops had dropped the word cooperative from their name. Recent critiques have accused electric co-ops of failing to distribute profits to their members and of using their collective lobbying power to support anti-environmental legislation. As I mentioned in the beginning, some co-op communities have started to push back against this limited view of democracy. Co-op communities across the country, from the rural south to the Colorado Ski Corridor, have been organizing around a new vision of infrastructure Um, one, which, one which takes inclusiveness and participation seriously, and which conceptualizes infrastructure as a platform for realizing other community desires beyond electricity, as well as addressing system systemic challenges like climate change. The question is whether these visions can not only rejuvenate local communities, but whether they can tie co-op members together across the country to take advantage of their continent-wide network of citizens along power lines, and to show an alternative path for cooperative energy to be transformative political power? Can they become as big as Chevron and stand as an alternative vision for industrial energy that draws together communities through empowerment rather than shared burdens? And how can we, as designers, planners, historians, social, science, social scientists, and urban theorists, not just uncover the infrastructural biases in the world around us, but help envision infrastructures that will help communities like Justice for Ecuador, West County Toxics Coalition, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, We Own It, and other energy groups? How do we make models of political inclusion and community health central to the design of, of large-scale technological systems? These are, the, these are the utopian imaginaries of infrastructure that are needed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Spinak. It is with, with great pleasure that I would like to introduce our moderator for this panel, John May. He's a founding partner in Millions, a Los Angeles-based design practice, and a design critic here at the GSD. His firm's experimental works have been exhibited widely. He's the author of several articles and of the book New Massings for New Masses, Collectivity After Orthography.
published by MIT Press. He's, a, he's as well co-editor of the collected volume, The Instruments Project, Architecture and Evidence, forthcoming this year. Please join me in welcoming John and, and all of our presenters to the table. Uh, thank you. Um, so I want to uh, bring up a few issues I think that uh, will maybe stitch across not only um, the two sessions today, but maybe even a little bit yesterday. Um, but I have to say two, two sort of uh, prefatory comments. One is, um, you know, there's, a, there's this, uh, this notion within Wittgenstein's language games that, um, that oftentimes the anchors of the game are the, are the least possible to talk about. That is, they are, they are the most empty terms because, and, they, and yet they serve as the anchor. And so that's the irony of the language game. And so you have to talk about all the terms around those terms rather than the terms themselves. And I think um, one of the impossibilities of this conference is all of those terms. And we, we, have, we, we have like a pile of them now. Um, so we can start with utopia, and now we've added infrastructure, nature, environment, and then I really want to add technology. Um, and so I think I am sympathetic, I want to start by saying I'm completely sympathetic to everyone who has used those terms over the past day and a half, but I'm now going to give you a hard time for having used them. Um, the second thing, the second preface here um, is just a, a little parable. I mean, Erica, I think, started this morning uh, during, well, didn't start, but during the, the discussion, began to kind of set up, maybe, maybe there's sort of this procession of utopias, and we, we were sort of teasing out how difficult it is to actually label those, whether they're necessity or desire. Or, um, so I want to tell that without using the word utopia, I want to tell a slightly different fable that's very simplistic, maybe oversimplistic, but it might be a way of... Um, tying some of these together and putting a few um, issues on the table. So the first would be uh, the state of nature, right? This would be, let, let's, put, let's put this into two simple, all two simple periods, right? The first period is the state of nature, so the state of pure wilderness, right? The second is now, we, now we, be, we can begin to talk about modernization, and we have what we might call primary modernization, where we rip ourselves from wilderness and we carve out some kind of um, place to live within wilderness. Um, the third would be what someone like Beck has called reflexive modernization, or we could call it secondary modernization. And there's not any kind of perfect date to put on that, but it was sometime, the, the date that a lot of people would like to put on it would be sometime in the, in the mid 20th century when, when the dangers were, when the primary dangers for most of the so-called developed world um, no longer stemmed from the wilderness itself, but now stemmed from having to deal with the consequences of primary modernization. Right? And I think that's, in some ways, that's a, a, against the background of, in some ways, the entire discussion that's gone on for at least today. Um, and so I want to point out a couple features of that transition as a way of talking about the, the three different um, papers we just heard. Um, the first of those would be to point out a few psychological differences between the primary phase and the secondary phase, at least as far as I see it. Um, there are a few things uh, that are characteristic to the secondary phase, um, and in particular, the secondary phase as we approach the present. One of those, I think, is a far more developed, if not culturally pervasive, at least somewhat culturally pervasive, uh, theory of the accident. That is to say, I, I can say that I think by now we are more familiar than perhaps primary than, than, than anyone in primary modernization was with the notion that technical systems tend to carry with them their own accidents, right? And that we're now realizing that the, the scale and the scope of those far exceeds anything that we imagined as a, uh, the original accident uh, of, of modernization, which might have just been a kind of collision of speed or the violence of speed or something like that that climate change as a kind of technical accident, right? And so in a way, the concept of accident expands so far that it starts to lose its bearings, it starts to lose its meaning, but at the same time, we have a much more robust theory, I think cultural theory or cultural sensitivity to the accident. Um, the second thing would be, I think, um, 
a, a, alongside that, a, a kind of psychological break that has occurred relatively recently around climate change, which I do think is a, a, a decisive psychological break that we all are left to speculate now whenever the wind blows. We're not entirely sure if the wind was always blowing that hard. <laughs> um, Maybe, maybe, maybe it's always blown that hard. Maybe it was always this cold last winter. And so uh, thinking back to the morning's presentations, this question of, of, um, that Joyce brought up about the, what do we use as our instrument for, for understanding the world? Do we, do we use instruments that, that can tell us and help us optimize certain kinds of thermal conditions, or do we use our body as a kind of sensor um, for certain kinds of conditions? And so I think there's a kind of confusion around that right now um, and a questioning uh, skepticism around that. Um, so there's those as just kind of general background conditions. Now I want to, um, as a way of tying these together, uh, talk about, and this was something I, I, that came up yesterday and maybe it's just on my, my brain right now, but um, just talk about management. Uh, because I think one of the realizations in the secondary phase, in the present phase of modernization, is the centrality of management. And here's what I mean by that, that uh, if we look very carefully at the, if we really take seriously the, the, the theory of the accident that, that we now have at our disposal, and we look very carefully at primary modernization, it's no longer possible to say something like, our infrastructure used to work well and it's too bad it doesn't work as well anymore which is to say our infrastructure has always been functioning and not functioning at the same time. So it's always been a strategy of externalizing its discontents, all of the discontents of modernity. We just don't have any outside, to, we don't have anywhere to put those discontents anymore. And so we have to live with them. So that's one of the first things that happens is it opens up, I think, a historical period of management. It opens up a historical understanding of management that I think would be a very ripe, uh, area of investigation for rewriting a certain history of modernity, a kind of under, a, what, what was a kind of hidden technical underside of modernity for a long time and that now needs to be rewritten as really a central aspect of, of modernization. And that is that against all of the uh, idealism of our language, our, where our language is able to separate out, separate out technology from environment or nature or humans from non-humans, that beneath all of that, the, it was, it's always been the manager's job to actually make things run. And I'm thinking here of, for example, this came up yesterday, uh, I'm thinking of, of Frederick Taylor's time space, uh, or uh, time motion charts, right? And if you look very carefully at time motion chart, um, what you realize is that none of those, none of those grand categories of enlightenment humanism are actually in that chart. There's no animals, there's no humans, there's no machines, um, there's no nature, there's no inside, there's no outside. They're just process charts. And so in some ways, I think what needs to happen is a re-examination of primary modernization from the very dirty, mundane point of view of the manager and really taking their categories very seriously. So that's the first thing. The second thing about management uh, that I'll say is, and this is just a broader observation, is if we look at really the, the period that um, the, our three speakers were talking about, if we contrast that with the present, and we talk about anything, something like environmental management or infrastructure or anything like that, I think we're dealing with two different conceptions of time. And the first one is historical time in which things were, in which technology was viewed as a thing that could be used progressively. Historical, in, in historical time, you use the history, you, you ponder over history as a way of improving the future and pr potentially predicting and controlling the future, right? The, the, the present and, and hopefully predicting and controlling the future. I think now we, we, sh we could have a conversation about the way in which all of the things we're talking about are now increasingly subject to management under real-time conditions. And I think real-time conditions are very different. They are about the instantaneous statistical management of events, right, in which you are trying to continuously calculate the risks and the probabilities of all possible future states and then try to manage among them in some ways. And so those, I want to put those two things on the table and then just bring up three, I want to make a specific comments to the three of you and then just open it up. Um, Sarah, in your, in your work, I'm, I'm, you deal with so many uh, issues that I've also tried to write about and so I'm, 
uh, extremely sympathetic to your conjugation uh, because that I think that that's one of the I, I look at that as as a, a necessary first move away from the conceptual framework of humanism that maybe is getting in the way of of helping us think through a new a new pre politics of the environment. So I think of like your your conjugating of, of techno environmentalism. At the same time, there's a somewhat um, devious part of me that wants to like conjugate the opposite terms. So to take the, the suffixes and prefixes and mix them up, and it kind of tells you as much, right? So I wrote down a few, um, which were natural-logical, technomental, techn envirological, and human, human mental. And like, <laughs> I don't know why we don't use those, mm -hmm. but I think that if we were to use those, it would actually tell us, it would not only reinforce the instability of all the language, cl which clearly you're acknowledging by just trying to hold on to it in a way, and it's very delicate because you're, you're trying to communicate communicate to a public in some ways, right, some of these issues, and, and so you can't be as willfully inventive with your language as a philosopher can be, but, um, so that's something that maybe you could talk about at some point. Um, uh, Abby, in yours, I'm really, I, the, this, this phrase, electric citizenry, I think is, I'm interested in how, how, can, how can we have a conversation right now where we put certain kinds of new concepts on the table? So I'm, I'm interested in the concept of electrical citizenry. Um, Daniel, I love like um, kind of utopia. Uh, I what I wanted to change that into one term and call it utopish, and um, <laughs> and I I think this 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 concept of survival ecologies, and I'm really curious to hear from you survival ecologies that are purposefully decoupled from the logic of the thermostatic interior, right? And I guess I'm I just want to hear you talk more about. In a, in a way, I think, I mean, I'm familiar with your work before this uh, event, and I think sometimes your work is seen as showing a time capsule of a moment, and I, I, what I like about your work is I think that it has the, if, if, it, if it really is taken to its extreme and we give it new language and give it new concepts, I think it's, it's possible that it, would, it actually could extend a, a period and a, 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 it could, I think, Give us an anchor for a new period of, of a kind of energy politics. And ultimately, that's what I, what I kind of want to put on the table here, which is that what this is all aiming towards is a shift from the age of ideas to the age of energies. And the idea that we have to have, we have to have a political language for the age of energies that is not at least wholly dependent on the conceptual framework of humanism. And I think that's what everyone here is struggling against. And I actually think that's what the conference in some ways is struggling against and or trying to deal with. What, how, what is... What is utopia or utopish? I don't know. Are we, are, we, are we now, are we just much more comfortable with the idea of utopish? Anyway. Who's going to start? You gave the first paper. Okay, that's my job. <laughs> thank you for those comments, um, and, and thank you for those papers, and I mean, it's really a, a very compelling afternoon. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I think in one, some ways, John, I kind of want to turn it around and question this premise of modernity, modernization, and its uh, potential. I mean, are we, I'm not saying have, I just said I'm not going to say have we ever been modern, but I mean, are we, are we in modernity, right? I mean, I think this is really a question, and I was actually really struck this morning, uh, Erica, this kind of question of kind of returning, going from need to desire and back to need, right? And and which I I have some issues with, but I think this sort of question of of historical trajectories, mm -hmm. right? And and sort of you know what is the the sort of presence of the past in these various things? And I think part of what the work uh, that I'm trying to tease out, and even in the sort of the ways that I'm trying to tease it out through these images, is is hoping to to develop is, is really along the lines of um, framing a, a, a way of, of, I mean, which is, well, it's first of all to say that I, I, mean, I kind of, I don't think we're in a state of kind of utopias of needs, which is because I think, I mean, this question of scarcity is always constructed, right? And, you know, I mean, the kind of clarion call today vis-a-vis -vis Bill McKibben, right, is sort of keep it in the ground, right? I mean, it's not a question of not having enough oil, it's just not having enough sinks, really, I mean, is what we don't have enough. I mean, I don't mean kitchen sinks, right, but carbon sinks, right, I mean, kind of places to put all the pollution in effect. And so, so there's, a, there's a way in which really what's at stake is how to uh, sort of transform social desires, right, and sort of make us want something that is not as polluting.
not make us. I mean, suggest, facilitate, encourage a certain type of desire. And, and so, I mean, I think there's, as much as I'm sympathetic to the kind of wilderness primary, secondary formulation, I think there's maybe, um, I mean, it all, it feels like it's all sort of maybe encompassed in a kind of, I don't know, I don't know if it's kind of 20th century, 1980s, right, but there's kind of something else happening now in which I think some of these trajectories are sort of spinning around on themselves mm -hmm. in different ways, mm -hmm. right? And part of what I like about the not-so-utopian house is this, net, I mean, both its own sort of, the arrows that are embedded within it, right, and its kind of cyclical condition, uh, uh, but also this sense of a kind of endless future, right, in which, kind of, I mean, algae just kind of grows and regrows. I mean, there's kind of this cycle of, you know, that, that just kind of goes on forever and um, uh, that sort of survival aesthetic, right, uh, that, that, that teases that out. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think there's a way to kind of try to reframe, you know, uh, I think s especially around the question of architecture, right, and this sort of, imposition that, I mean, I don't know if this is kind of universally felt, but this kind of struggle to articulate an, a history of the architectural past that's kind of not framed by these kind of structures of modernity as, as, as aggressively, while also attending to them, right? I mean, we can't pretend that, that, that they, they weren't there, but give them a sort of different valence and try to understand how what, you know, part of what I've been trying to do in this project and the sort of broader questions of kind of reassessing uh, Architectural modernity on environmental terms is is not calling modernists environmentalists, right? But sort of recognizing that at the at the root of the global technological project uh, was attention to environmental conditions, right? And, and sides of the table, and so it's another. I mean, just the sort of last thing I'll say is that I mean, I think you know another way of sort of framing that is is recognizing that you know I mean on the one hand the sort of counterfactual of uh, you know, we sort of, I mean, a lot of the times this, the solar house material ends up, so, well, you know, what happened to it? Well, kind of oil took over, right? But really, it's just a question of investment, right? I mean, intensive economic, political, diplomatic labor investments were made into extracting oil, still are, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we're trained historians who can't be, aren't allowed to be counterfactual, but if we imagine the sort of billions of dollars being invested in solar energy, I mean, who knows, right? Or wind or geothermal or what have you. But I think it's also the case that this kind of this kind of issue of technologies and accidents, right, is somewhat a perspectival or a sort of uh, I don't know if it's a it's not exactly a sort of framework according to classes, but sort of I mean I'm thinking you know this sort of emergent you know, this information we're getting I mean just in the past kind of few weeks, right, of you know Chevron has been sort of planning has it been intentionally changing the climate, right? I mean this is a project. Mm -hmm. This is not. That, that sort of, you know, this not only did they know they were changing the climate, but there was this kind of notion that, uh, you know, more oil will be needed as more air conditioning is needed. I mean, this is a sort of an economic strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, accidents, what is one person's accident is maybe someone else's project, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. I think that sort of uh, complication of trajectories is maybe also fruitful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'll pass it on from there. Thanks for your comments, and, and the three papers together are so interesting, too. Um, I appreciate your opening comment and then also the comment about my paper and about the limits of language and discourse and categories and terms and the ways in which, as scholars, we're constantly caught in between, that, that we need, to, need and want to describe and try to analyze the world, and yet simultaneously we're always aware of, of the limits that those terms and categories impose upon our analyses. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also appreciated your point about th that um, maybe we choose certain kinds of terms because they have, uh, they might be more legible in, in, in terms of real political implications versus, you know, envirotechnical versus technomental. I really like <laughs> technomental and I want to jot down the others you rattled off. That was the only one I got. Um, I particularly like technomental because, you know, are you mental, mental if you're really engaged? This makes us technomental. <laughs> yeah, and, and this, and you know, right. Um, because I think you're right, I think a, a lot of us are really committed to um, th thinking about real world stakes and real world politics. So how do we bridge the analytical and the political in a way that um, does justice to our various scholarly commitments, but also doesn't get the larger implications um, lost in the process. Um, I also loved the synergies between the three papers, especially I was thinking that um, 
this, you know, this panel was about total utopias, and we all talked about discomforts with energy systems. And so I'm wondering why, it, is, is it just us, or is it, is it something broader that thinking about total utopias leads us to think about these, these global socio-technical systems? Um, I think in, in all three of our papers, there, whether explicitly or not, we were, we were problematizing this relationship between the body and the large-scale technical system as a way of thinking about, thinking about these, these problematic ideas. Um, and one of the things, um, one of the things that the, the utopish house, I guess, <laughs> made me think about was um, algae in the last couple of years has been, um, well, not the last couple, like the last 10, I guess, 10 or 15 years, um, has been seen as a fuel, right? Um, and yet, in, in the vision of that house, it was a fuel for human bodies. Mm -hmm. And so how have we moved from that to I don't know, no longer thinking of ourselves as things that are empowered, mm. um, but only we only get power from the systems around us. Mm. Um, yeah, I guess I really connected with the idea of a gentle, docile cyborg. I see that <laughs> as a as a um, as as a underlying trend in um, rural electrification as well. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it at that. That maybe we should think about. Um, Maybe it would be interesting to also talk about human bodies in within these total utopias. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I, we can open it up also to to anybody else. Yeah, Joyce up there too. I'll I'll throw out a question um, which is not entirely coherent, but as I listen to all three of you and it. It comes a little bit, it's, it springs a little bit from what John was talking about. Um, one of the synergies was actually the ways in which you all deployed some notion of the commons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> commons. Uh, the commons, as in uh, the tragedy of the commons. Um, and it started in a lovely way with you and the green belt running through the house, literally internalizing the commons. We got the Rhone and different understandings of what that might be and who loses out and who wins out when it's part of a national project. And with you, interestingly, um, cap capitalism, cooperation, and uh, the rural condition. And I just wondered uh, about, um, more broadly, um, that trope of the commons, which is not so much an empty term, but rather uh, something that is deeply experienced and lost and then uh, sort of architecturalized in your case. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you might expand on that. I'll take the first step with that, if that's okay. Yeah, um, and I'll just say that the, the commons is, um, is a concept that like cooperatives is political and, and unequal. And so if we're thinking about the commons, um, there's a lot of, of design behind what counts as a commons and who, who is within and who's without it, I mean, who's external to it. Um, and so it's, it's a, I, I mean, I would add that to our list of words, that it's powerful, it's, it's, um, it's something that can be harnessed, and that might be dangerous. Um, so that, that was, I guess, probably adding to your question, um, more so than answering it. But. I guess I would add briefly that um, I certainly haven't thought about the commons a lot, but what your comment or question provoked for me was thinking about how people people in social conflict is usually the focal point of, of the commons or the tragedy of the commons. And what if we do the post-humanist move and think about non-humans, the what in the commons as well, and that it's not just social conflicts, but social and environmental or even which... Um, which non-human. I, I taught Anna Singh's new mushroom book on Wednesday, and so I've got mushrooms in forest and Japanese and Southeast Asian pickers in my head in terms of um, radically opening up and also flattening kind of the, the differences among um, humans and non-humans, and that there's multiple non-humans involved in, in what might be good for the Matsutake mushroom might not be good for other ecological species that we normally think of as good in the forests. So there could be some interesting issues around that. Yeah, I'll just say really quickly, I mean, you know, obviously the sun as a sort of 
common you know, source <laughs> of, of fuel. And, and I think that's been sort of the lure and the obstacle, in effect, right? I mean, that, uh, that, that uh, which is to say that there's this kind of sense of, well, then let's make a lot of money off of it, right? And, and then, well, but we can't own it, so we can't make money off right? I mean, this kind of, it's the sort of obstacle in terms of the ways in which solar energy has since the, I mean, really the mid-1800s, if not even earlier, you know, has sort of been seen as a means to uh, counter some other energy regimes, right? Uh, but I think there's another way, I mean, so that's sort of one piece that, that kind of, you know, of course, determines everything. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things that's been increasingly interesting to me as I've played out this research and that I really struggle with as somebody who sort of grew up in the kind of alienated suburbs of Colorado that, the suburbs is a commons, right? And the kind of sense of which that kind of open space that would allow, I, you know, maybe not so much on physical terms, but kind of we can share nature in this space, right? We can share uh, infrastructure in this space and, and this, you know, even the kind of open lot condition that allowed for different orientations and kind of played out the, the different architectures on those terms. So, you know, I, I have a hard time appreciating the suburbs, but I think there was a sort of moment in the late 40s when it was a space of opportunity on, on somewhat on these terms. Um, the, uh, the, uh, to just r repeat the sort of tragedy of the commons tragedy, uh, it, the, the whole idea was that there was this human rational agency competes with the, the public good uh, rather than enabling it, and that there's therefore uh, the commons doesn't survive that competition. And uh, so that it's doomed to that unless you limit the uh, you know rational the yeah the performance of the human rationality, um, and I'm thinking that this is a perfect situation for the manager, right? The manager is the one on the ground watching over all things, not uh, taking either the self ration the rationalist humanist position, nor taking the uh, public co cooperative position, but actually watching over like how many sheep are grazing, how many blades of grass and checking on the sustainability of that and the you know the the common resource is preserved so maybe um, that could be like a commonish sort of theory <laughs> which i think is terrific actually <laughs> the the, the, ma the introduction of the manager which maybe that's what eleanor ostrom is talking about to some degree is the manager is the self is not the self organization the people that are the one who watches over and in, and establishes some kind of relationship that makes self organization possible mm -hmm. and watches out for the other forces to some degree that are going to undermine it. Mm -hmm. Right, and just to add to that, um, to you know, no, 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 not the overseer. You don't want the overseer in my case. I didn't really, but um, no, just to add a little bit because Eleanor Ostrom was obviously on my mind, and one of the things that's really interesting um, as an economist economist is that she really pushed the envelope in terms of thinking that even, this is where she was maybe utopian, uh, even in the most radical unchecked capitalist circumstances or in, you know, sort of the darkest uh, impulses of nationalism, a commons is somehow maybe necessary. And what are the, what is the debris of that? What is the ruin of that? That's all. This has a, has... yeah, no, I'm going there. Thoughts? Well, I mean, I just um, a couple, one, one comment on that. I mean, what, I completely agree with your critique of my fable, which is, you know, we have never been modern. So I, I have increasingly just been thinking we, we have always been managers. So the, <laughs> that, that while, while the philosophers and ethicists get to have their high concepts about um, the division of, the perfect division of things into perfect categories, somebody has to keep the world running. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like the conversation this morning, somebody has to actually, a committee has to come together and actually make sure there's like heat in the room. And um, so yeah, I, I, that's in some ways, and one of the fascinating things about that um, is that the the mathematics of the manager is that this is it's literally techniques bor borrowed from gambling, learned in gambling. I mean, this is Ian Hacking's work, right? Mm -hmm. That that it's the the manager is a risk manager. They're always hedging their bets, and that to me is the kind of secret history of of a lot of the stuff we're talking about. That's the secret history of any utopia, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is that somebody has to like the trash has to get taken out. And the, and the consequences of where you put the trash and all of that has to be have to be calculated. I mean, that, I mean, in a way, that's really I think a hinge to it too. And 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 
you know, I'm trying to get my head around this sort of managerial impulse and its kind of distinction from, from the sort of governmental impulse in a way, but uh, the maintenance issue, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of, you know, the kind of, I mean, you know, and again, part of the issue, I mean, not that this is so substantive, but part of the issue with most of these solar houses is they sort of collapsed technologically because they required so much upkeep, right? I mean, you just, you can't really do that and still have a life. And so, you know, and I, I think this sort of question of, of managing, I mean, even of the commons, it's like, okay, there's somebody to oversee it or sort of somehow, you know, partition the space, but there's also kind of somebody to, not oversee it, sorry, but to manage it and, and partition in various ways and kind of let some things in and keep some things out. But then there's also kind of, you know, the trimming and the mm -hmm. keeping the fences secured and, you know, these other forms mm -hmm. of kind of labor that get invoked. Keep that Gideon's household manager. Exactly, yeah. right, yeah, that mm -hmm. seem also of, I wanted to come back to this question about uh, utopia, the body, and food. Um, I think uh, my awareness that this was the 500th anniversary of the publication of Utopia had been crowded out of my mind because it's also the 250th anniversary of the birth of Thomas Robert Malthus um, in 1766, who of course at a moment when we were supposed to be moving from the, the scarcity narrative to the abundance narrative, and when all kinds of utopias were being proposed, um, argues against um, the Marquis de Condorcet and William Godwin that no, human happiness cannot increase forever <laughs> because we will run out of food <laughs> before that happens. Um, so I really, it's, it's it, um, wonderful, I think, uh, that finally everyone is talking about energy I do remember a moment when it was sort of taboo and people would not um, have so robustly talked about how we have to move to a different kind of future. It is interesting that population has not come up because I think that still is taboo um, and that you can't think of utopias where contraception is built <laughs> mm. into the plan. Um, so I just uh, note that um, 10 years from now, whatever students are running uh, this conference, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether ideas of how society has to be engineered or managed um, are, in a sense, fuller in their scope about what natural resources might mean. Just by necessity. Yeah. Yeah. Can I respond briefly to that? In my undergraduate um, classes, I, I teach environmental ethics, long story why, even though I'm not a philosopher and ethicist. My students actually don't want to talk about, well, they're very interested in energy because of climate change, but if we think about energy within the larger discussion of consumption, my privileged Cornell students don't want to talk about the politics of consumption. What they want to do is talk about the politics of population because it's very cl clear who's to blame there, right? The global south. Mm. And they're quite comfortable with that, but they're not comfortable with pointing the finger at their families or practices or broader societies and so forth. So it might be interesting to think about in what context do certain issues come to the ground, come to the foreground or tend to get backgrounded. Yeah, though um, I think they might be operating according to a kind of oddly positioned distinction because Malthus himself had said that one of the problems with population was that the rich tended to have too many children because they consumed more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is actually a question not only of absolute numbers of children being yeah. produced, but who and where, and then yeah. how much they will consume. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, the, say, the, the, I, I was just struck by the fact that the movie Children of Men actually was the crisis was underpopulation and the inability to perpetuate population because every, because uh, fertility had been canceled out by pollution and all sorts of toxicity in the environment and uh, uh, and cancer and other things and so it was a kind of so it's it's a great it's a great point you're making I think about sort of population in general as a as a utopic uh, topic actually you know the um, um, so I just wanted to throw that in well, you know the um, the Malthusian uh, you know, the, the debates around energy in the 40s and 50s were precisely framed as the neo-Malthusians against the others, right? And in fact, this kind of utopish principle that emerged that is more or less played out, right, that, that uh, this guy, Harold Barnett, actually an economist trained here at Harvard by Vasily Leontief, who argued that the sort of threat of scarcity 
was necessary to kind of encourage the uh, uh, types of technological innovation that would allow scarcity to be avoided, right? So that there was this kind of fruitful, you know, felicitous dynamic. He couldn't use synergy because it was not, uh, you know, wouldn't, we didn't have that word yet. Rapp probably did, but he didn't use it. Um, this dynamic that would allow for, you know, uh, technology to sort of solve the problem, right, in effect. And, and, and part of what I've been trying to tease out of this material is, is the ways in which that he's also, you know, that these questions about technology and solutions that are so much a part, at least in the kind of sustainable discourse of architecture, right, that there, and, and, and other places as well, uh, there's the potential even to reframe that in the way that this sort of book tries to, to, to make this argument that, that really uh, we're not talking, the technology might produce solutions, but it also produces new subjects, right, and sort of new forms of desire and new aspirations. And so uh, precisely this kind of intersection, uh, both across this Malthusian, neo-Malthusian, uh, uh, nexus. Um, I mean, just, and the other piece just to throw out relative to this broader question of population, you know, I actually teach the population bomb, the book, uh, in my post-war architectural survey and uh, relative to Archigram, you know, for those of us kind of in the field. Um, and, and the students, you know, kind of eat it up. I mean, it's such a, the language is kind of funny today, right? I mean, because he's so freaked out, right? Ehrlich, I mean, if you've, I mean, just the first kind of chapter where he's just kind of like, ah. Oh. Um, and, and the, you know, and I think there's a way in which the students, my students, my, you know, a lot of the students actually that I teach at Penn are, are from East Asia, right? And, and sort of coming at this from a very different perspective and, and have a kind of sense of the, the, the relevance of the document, but also, um, you know, kind of, yeah, it's overpopulated, but we shouldn't really be scared about it. We should just deal with, you know, we should find a solution again, right? So this question of, we might have all these problems, but we'll find solutions, I think, is embedded in, in even that discourse, right? I, I hate to be the manager imposing the schedule. But, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will be back at 4 p.m. sharp for the keynote lecture by Professor Damien White. Good stuff.